In March of 2015, 22-year-old Sailor Gilliams and her good friend Brendan Vega, who was also 22, decided they wanted to go hiking. Now, they were both highly inexperienced hikers, so when they were looking in the area for places to go hiking, they were looking for novice trails, things that they would be able to manage. And they thought they had found one in Santa Barbara, California. And so they headed off in that direction and they took off on this particular trail. A little ways into their hike and they started to feel like, man, the terrain here is pretty treacherous. This is way more difficult than we were expecting when we looked at the map. And as they continued and they're climbing over these huge boulders and it just seems totally like an advanced trail, they start to wonder, you know, did we veer off the trail? Worried they might be lost, they turned around and began backtracking, hoping to find the trail and find some landmark that would allow them to confirm they were on the right trail. As they're backtracking, not only do they not find the trail, but they don't find any trail. They've managed to go completely off the path and are now in this kind of random boulder field that they have no idea where it is on the map. Navigating this terrain in the daytime with light would have been difficult even for an experienced hiker. But now it's nighttime, they don't have flashlights and they're jumping boulder to boulder and Sailor at some point loses her footing and falls and fractures her leg. Brendan rushes over and tries to help Sailor stand up, but she can't move. And so Brendan tries to put her on his shoulders and starts walking with her. And that works for a little while until they're passing by this waterfall and they fall off of it. And they come careening down, they smash onto the ground, they survive the fall, but Brendan now has a broken elbow and Sailor now has a broken ankle on top of her broken leg. Sailor's in excruciating pain and because of this fall, there's just no way Brandon's going to be able to lift her back up and keep walking. And so the decision was made that Brendan was going to go try to find help on his own and that she would stay here and continue to yell for help in hopes that someone might hear her before Brendan got back. He takes off and as soon as he's around the corner and gone, Sailor begins screaming for help and she would continue screaming for help all through the night well into the next day. About 24 hours after Brendan had left, he still had not returned. And at this point, Sailor's in and out of consciousness. She knows that she's going downhill quickly unless someone finds her. By the following afternoon, Brendan is still not back yet. So laying face down in the mud with flies buzzing all over her head, she was helpless and trapped. And there was nothing she could do but wait until either a miracle occurred and someone found her, or most likely she just dies. So at the same time that Sailor and Brendan are going through this horrible ordeal, three totally unconnected people decide they want to blow off work and school and just go escape into nature. And so they settle on a hike that would bring them to a waterfall in Santa Barbara, California. Even though this waterfall was a popular tourist attraction, it was very difficult to get to it. It basically required 45 minutes of almost uphill climbing across boulder fields. Very dangerous and it's not something for a novice hiker to be doing. So they reach the parking lot, they take off on this hike, and when they're just at the base of the waterfall, instead of taking the main trail up to the top, the three hikers decide, let's actually go around off the trail to this pocket of boulders over here, where there's a couple freshwater pools that have formed underneath the base of the waterfall. So they leave the main trail and they're climbing over these huge boulders, it's very dangerous. And at some point, one of the hikers starts taking pictures as they're kind of going across these boulders. Through the viewfinder, as they're taking pictures, they notice something out of the corner of their eye that's in frame. It was like this red flash of something. And so the hiker puts their camera down and she looks down where she sees this red and she can tell right away that it's someone's hair. It's a girl's dyed red hair. And it was Sailor. The hikers went down to Sailor and they called 911 and they came in, they airlifted her out of there and Sailor would actually make a full recovery. Unfortunately, Sailor's friend, Brendan, did not make it. They found his body about 100 meters away from where she had been laying. After the ordeal, the woman who was taking those pictures and had spotted Sailor out of the corner of her eye, she went to her camera and was flicking through some of the pictures she had taken during the hike. She had inadvertently taken a picture of Sailor before they had found her. So had it not been for these hikers being where they were and taking those pictures and noticing her red hair, this picture almost certainly would have become the last picture of Sailor Gilliams alive. Jolie Callen was this little four foot 10, 18 year old girl from Alabama 
who despite her tiny stature, had a huge personality and was incredibly popular. Everybody seemed to love this girl. In 2015, Jolie had just graduated high school and was planning to move away from her town and go to college outside of Alabama. And she was really excited about it. But she had a bit of a problem because she had this boyfriend named Lauren Brunner, who she had repeatedly tried to end the relationship with because he was so possessive, but she hadn't been able to successfully break up with him yet. Every time she tried to, he would threaten that he was gonna hurt himself or that he was gonna hurt her if she ever left him. And so she never quite followed through. But with college on the horizon and to her what felt like this fresh start once she left Alabama, she finally pulled the plug on her relationship with Lauren and made it very clear that they are done. And she was firm on that decision, even when Lauren did start lashing out and yelling at her and pleading with her and doing everything he could to win back her affection, but it just wasn't gonna work because she had moved on. For weeks, Lauren was trying to convince Jolie to change her mind, but again, Jolie just stayed firm on her decision. And after quite some time, it seemed like Lauren had finally got the message because his messages and cries for her to change her mind had stopped and there was finally a little bit of distance between the two of them. On August 29th, 2015, Lauren would break that silence and would reach out to Jolie and ask her if she wanted to go for a hike with him, simply as friends. Jolie was naturally hesitant about this, worrying that you know this hike as friends could very quickly turn into something more that she didn't want, but she did want to remain friends with Lauren. He was very important to her. And so she reluctantly agrees to go on this hike. After Jolie responded to Lauren that she was willing to go, Lauren was really excited. And so he posted on Instagram this picture of himself looking, I guess, excited. It's hard to tell from the image, but the caption basically said that he was excited about going on this hike with her and that things were, quote, looking up. At the same time, after Jolie had given that answer to Lauren, after she had agreed, yes, I'll go hiking with you, she texted her friend jokingly, if something happens to me, you'll know who I was with. The next day on August 30th, Lauren picks up Jolie and he begins documenting their trip on his Instagram page. Jolie gets in the car and he takes a picture of her and he captions it on our way to go hiking. The second image that he uploads is of Jolie walking her dog Kiba in a parking lot. It appears that this lot is at the base of the hike they're about to go on. The third image shows Jolie standing on a rock overlooking this forest and she's holding her dog Kiba. And it's clear based on this picture that now they've actually begun the ascent up this trail. The fourth and final picture that was uploaded to his Instagram page shows Jolie standing on a rocky cliff and she's holding her own camera up and she's taking pictures out over this valley. And the picture was captioned, Jolie the photographer. Immediately after this picture was taken, Lauren would shoot Jolie twice and push her off of that cliff. He was sentenced to 52 years in jail and bragged to the inmates he was with that if he couldn't have her, no one could. In November of 1961, a wealthy doctor named Arthur Duperalt chartered a luxury yacht called the Bluebell to take he and his family from Fort Lauderdale, Florida to the Bahamas. Along with his family, which was Jean, his wife, his oldest son, Brian, who was 14, Terry Joe, who was 11, and Renee, who was seven, Arthur also brought along Julian Harvey, who was a close friend of his, that he had hired to be the captain of the ship. And Julian was gonna bring along his wife, who was named Mary Dean. And so on November 8th, 1961, the Duperalts and the Harveys set sail on the Bluebell, and by all accounts, their trip was going extremely well. But on the fifth night of the cruise, Terry Jo was down in the sleeping quarters of the Bluebell when she woke up to the sound of stamping sounds and screaming coming from above. She was so scared about what could be going on up there that at first she didn't do anything. But eventually she summoned the courage, got out of her bunk, and she kind of slowly made her way up the stairs and poked her head out onto the deck. And immediately she sees that her family is lying on the ground. They're all deceased. As Terry Jo is frozen in terror, Julie and Harvey comes running up to her and tells her to go back down into the sleeping quarters. And so not knowing any better, she just turns around and runs back down to her bunk. But as she's sitting there, she sees that water is flooding into the bluebell. She can't stay down here or she's gonna drown. So Terry Jo goes back up the steps. She goes onto the main deck and she sees Julie and Harvey who's standing over the edge of the boat. And she yells to him and says, are we sinking? And he looks at her and he just says, yes. And then he promptly jumps over the railing and swims to the lifeboat that had detached from the bluebell and was drifting away. He climbs onto it and takes off, abandoning her on the sinking ship. 
unbeknownst to Terry Joe, was the reason the Bluebell was sinking in the first place was because of Julian Harvey. When he was hired to be the captain of the ship, he used this as an opportunity to bring his new wife out with him and then kill her and collect on her insurance policy. Because in her life insurance policy, there was a clause where he would get double the amount of money if she died in the case of a freak accident. But it's speculated that while he was attacking her, one of the Duperalts had seen him doing it, and so in order to cover his tracks, he had turned on the Duperalt family. And so while it's not entirely clear why he didn't just finish the job with Terry Joe, it seems like when he jumped over the railing and took off with the lifeboat, he must have assumed that Terry Joe was gonna sink with the rest of the family, and then there would be no more evidence, no more witnesses. So 11-year-old Terry Joe, as she's standing on this sinking ship, she snaps into action. She remembers seeing a cork float that was pinned up against one of the walls of the ship. And she runs over and she undoes it. She puts it on the water. She climbs on top of it just as the bluebell sinks under the surface of the water and disappears. And so now she's just stranded out in the middle of the ocean. She's got no food, no water, no shelter from the sun on this little dinky cork float. Over the next couple of days, as she drifted along aimlessly in the ocean, her cork float would begin to disintegrate and she would have to start positioning her body on the float so there wasn't much weight on it because it was basically beginning to sink and the only position she could find that worked was by dangling her feet in the water so she's half on this cork float half of her body is in the water and so what began happening is parrotfish began swimming up and biting her toes her feet and her legs but she couldn't do anything about it she couldn't put her legs on the cork board or it would sink after two days of balancing precariously on this cork float the parrotfish disappeared and a bunch of dolphins surrounded her and later she would go on to say that this was the only part of this horrible ordeal where she felt some sort of comfort these dolphins just swam around her and almost formed a protective barrier around her that kept the parrotfish away and kept kept other predators away from her. On November 16th, 1961, 84 hours after the Bluebell had sunk, a Greek freighter actually spotted Terry Joe. Amidst all the white caps, they were able to see this little girl on a float and they drove over and there she was. And initially when they went down to try to get her, there was so many sharks swimming around her that they had to be very careful that they didn't accidentally knock her into the water where she might be eaten by sharks. But eventually they were able to get Terry Joe into their basket and pulled her up onto the ship and she would make a full recovery. As for Julian Harvey, he had made it back to shore and had told authorities that the Bluebell had caught on fire and that everyone had drowned except for him. You know, he had done his best to save them, but he was the only one who could get out. And as luck would have it, he was literally in a police station giving information about what happened when the police were informed that Terry Joe had survived. And the police, they turn to Julian and they say, Terry Joe survived. She's in the hospital. She's going to make a recovery. And Julian was said to have gone totally ashen in the face and then kind of composed himself and said, why, that's wonderful. Julian quickly excused himself and fled to a Miami hotel, and the next day he was found dead in his hotel room. This is the picture of Terry Joe that was taken by one of the Greek sailors right when they pulled up alongside her before they pulled her onto their ship. This image would soon appear in publications all over the world. Despite Terry Joe's horrifying ordeal, she would go on to live a very normal life and would have six children of her own. Soon after the Beatles dissolved in 1969, one of the four members, John Lennon, left his native England and moved to New York City. Lennon and his wife, Yoko Ono, took up residence in the Dakota, which is a very famous building that typically houses the rich and famous people of New York. As soon as Lennon moved to New York, he said that he felt relieved because he didn't have to worry about going outside and getting mobbed by a massive crowd of people that were obsessed with the Beatles. There were people that were huge Beatles fans in New York, but they seemed more respectful and they would ask for his autograph, but they would mostly leave him alone. Mark David Chapman had always been a massive fan of the Beatles with a particular interest in John Lennon. But after a 1966 interview where John Lennon kind of off the cuff said that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus, this soured Chapman's adoration of Lennon. One of Chapman's high school friends recalls around this time frame Chapman rewriting the song Imagine by John Lennon to read Imagine If John Lennon Was Dead. 
Chapman started referring to Lenin as a poser and said that he espoused virtues and ideals that he himself did not practice. And so in relative short order, following that 1966 interview, Chapman went from this adoring fan of the Beatles and John Lennon to really solely hating John Lennon and everything he stood for. By 1980, it's safe to say Mark Chapman had become obsessed with John Lennon. Specifically, he had become obsessed with hating John Lennon. In October of 1980, Chapman quits his job as a security guard and flies to New York City. For two months, he stayed in the city and didn't really do much of anything. He would just periodically walk past the Dakota where John Lennon supposedly was living, but beyond that, he really didn't do anything in the city. But that would all change on December 8th, 1980. On that day, Chapman went to the Dakota and he stood right outside the entrance to this building and just waited in hopes that he might run into John Lennon. At 5 p.m. that day, John Lennon comes out with his wife, Yoko Ono, and they walk right past Mark Chapman, who flags them down, and he asks John if he can have his autograph. And John Lennon, even though he has a limousine waiting for him, and there's people that are starting to notice that, oh, that's John Lennon, people are coming over, John still took the time to sign an autograph for Mark Chapman. He was very friendly with Mark and asked him if this is enough, do you want anything else? And Mark said, no, that's it, that's fine. And John Lennon said, okay, take care. And John and his wife, Yoko Ono, turned and went into the limousine and they drove away. When the couple got back to the Dakota that night, Mark Chapman had not left. John Lennon and Yoko Ono get out of their vehicle and they walk past Mark Chapman, who's standing right outside the front door. It's unclear if Mark and John had any interaction, but as soon as they passed Mark and were making their way into the building, Mark Chapman drew a gun and shot John Lennon four times in the back. And John Lennon staggers into the lobby screaming, I'm shot, I'm shot, before collapsing and dying. And Mark Chapman, he knew what he was doing. He just stood there, put the gun back in his pocket and just waited to be arrested. Chapman's lawyers wanted him to plead insanity, but he refused and instead said, I was totally sane. I knew what I was doing. I chose to shoot John Lennon and I plead guilty. And he was given 20 years to life in jail. And while he was in jail, he would admit that the only reason he did that was to become famous. That was it. This is the picture of Mark Chapman getting that autograph from John Lennon in front of the Dakota just hours before he would gun him down. He's still in jail today, and he actually just had his 11th parole hearing last month in August of 2020, and it was denied. On July 17th, 2014, people at Amsterdam's bustling international airport began boarding Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 that was bound for Kuala Lumpur. The 283 passengers on board were from all over the world. Some were traveling for vacation, some were going home, others were just traveling for business. In addition to the 283 passengers, there were also 15 crew members that rounded out the flight to a total of 298 people on board MH17. One of the passengers, before walking down the runway to get on the flight, took a picture of the plane itself and uploaded it to Facebook and kind of jokingly captioned it, if we go missing, this is what it looks like, in reference to another Malaysian Airlines flight, Flight 370, that had actually gone missing just a couple of months earlier. Once the boarding was complete on MH17, one of the passengers on board uploaded to Instagram a short video of passengers stuffing their luggage into bins and the captain coming over the intercom saying that, you know, boarding is complete and it's time to turn off your cell phones as we prepare for takeoff. A 15-year-old Dutch boy named Gary Slock and his mother Petra had just sat down inside the plane and they could barely contain their excitement. The pair had signed up for what they were calling a vacation of a lifetime with a group that took single parents and their children on these lavish vacations. Gary, who was the goalkeeper for a soccer team, had been telling his family how jealous his teammates were of this trip he was about to go on with his mother. Before Gary turned off his phone, as instructed by the captain, he took a selfie of he and his mom grinning ear to ear, excited about their trip, and he uploaded it to Facebook for his friends and family to see. Gary turns off his cell phone, puts it away, and he and his mom sit back and get ready for takeoff. The plane takes off without a hitch. It gets up to cruising altitude. And you know, it's gonna be a long flight. It's about 12 hours from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. And so everybody on board is kind of settling in. They're getting their iPads out. They're getting a book out maybe. The crew is making their rounds, offering snacks and drinks. And you know, people are looking out the window. It's a beautiful day. And everyone's just kind of settling in for a long flight. About three hours after takeoff, around 4 p.m., the captain of MH17 got in touch with air traffic control at the nearby airport, which was in Ukraine. 
The pilot told controllers that everything was fine. He was flight level 33,000 feet. The controllers acknowledged that and said, hey, there's a little bit of air traffic in the direction you're going. You need to reroute your course very slightly. The pilot acknowledged this change in course and was beginning to tell them what he was going to do next when he cut out. The controllers on the ground in Ukraine began hailing MH17 to try to get the captain back online. They couldn't reach him. The plane had sent no distress signals, and over the course of their communication, the controllers had not noticed anything abnormal. And so this sudden radio silence really didn't make any sense. Yelena Brichenko was a 20-year-old bank teller living in Ukraine who happened to be looking up right as MH17 was flying overhead. She would later say that what she saw would haunt her for the rest of her life. As she was watching, MH17 just explodes and the people inside of the plane very clearly get ejected out of the plane. And she's watching as these people and bits of plane are falling from 33,000 feet and they come crashing down in this huge fiery inferno. The theory, backed by US intelligence, was that pro-Russian separatists could have fired a missile at this plane thinking it was Ukrainian military. It was not, it was just civilians. All 298 people on board MH17 perished, including Gary and Petra. This is the selfie that Gary took moments before takeoff with his mother as they were excited about their vacation. Family and friends that saw this picture on Facebook would say that this image perfectly captures Gary's wonderful personality and the love that Gary and Petra had for each other. From the outside, Bart Whitaker appeared to love his family. He and his younger brother Kevin were extremely close, and Bart and his father shared a passion for long-distance cycling and would often go out and bike around the neighborhood together. Bart's family would regularly go on vacation to places like Cancun, and the pictures of Bart with his family on these vacations are always him beaming with happiness and love for his family. On December 10th, 2003, Bart, who was 23, almost 24 years old at the time, made a special announcement to his family. He told his family that he had just finished taking his final exams of his senior year at nearby Sam Houston State College and that he was gonna graduate. Bart was not a natural student and frankly struggled in college, and so this was a really big announcement and the family was really excited for him, especially his parents. And so they said, we have to go out and celebrate. And so they went out to a restaurant and they're having this really expensive, lavish dinner. And in fact, his parents had bought a really nice Rolex watch to give to Bart if he were to graduate college. And so here he is announcing it and they thought, you know what, now's a good time to give it to him. They give him his Rolex and they're asking people at nearby tables to take their pictures and everybody just seems so happy and the parents are so proud of Bart. After they finish dinner, they're all smiles, they pile back in the family car and they start making their drive back to Sugarland, Texas where the Whitaker residence was. It was inside of this upper class suburb about 40 minutes away from Houston, Texas. On the drive home, his parents are endlessly talking about how proud they are of Bart and how excited they are for his future. They get back to their house, they pull in the driveway, and Bart's brother and parents make their way up to the front door. Bart is behind them and he says, hey, I forgot something in the car. He turns around and goes back to the car as his brother and his parents walk into the house and are immediately gunned down by an assassin waiting inside of the Whitaker residence. Bart hears the shooting and runs back inside the house. He sees his family is down. He ends up wrestling with the shooter who ends up shooting him but hits him in the arm before escaping the house. A neighbor hears the shooting and runs outside and sees this chaotic scene. They call 911. Police show up and Bart's brother, Kevin, has passed away as well as his mother. They both died on scene. As for Bart and Bart's father, they would go to the hospital and they would both make a full recovery. So this huge investigation is launched to figure out who this assassin was and why he was attacking the Whitaker family. And quickly they discovered that Bart Whitaker had hired him. Bart Whitaker wanted his family killed so he could take their money. And he had had the assassin shoot him in the arm to make it look like, you know, this was not his fault and he wasn't involved. Here's a picture from the night they were out celebrating Bart's big accomplishment that he had finished his final exams, except Bart was a total liar and he had stopped going to classes ages ago. He was failing every class and was not even close to graduating. In this picture, Bart knows that the assassin he hired is currently sitting in their house, waiting for them to return when he is gonna open fire and kill Bart's family. The people in this picture with him are going to be murdered literally hours later and he knows it. Bart was convicted in 2007 for hiring the hitman and was given the death penalty, but 
40 minutes before his execution, the governor of Texas commuted his sentence to a life sentence because oddly enough, Bart's own father, one of the people he tried to have killed, had forgiven him and did not want to see his last remaining family member be executed. World War II, the Soviet Union began investing heavily into nuclear power, and by 1977, the V.I. Lenin nuclear power station located in Chernobyl, Ukraine, was finally operational. The station itself was comprised of four reactors that were each labeled 1, 2, 3, and 4. On April 25th, 1986, a group of very sleep-deprived plant workers began running a series of routine tests on nuclear reactor number 4. They were trying to see if the reactor could still be cooled even in the event of a complete power loss. But during the test, perhaps because they were sleep-deprived and just didn't feel like doing it, they started cutting corners and violated a number of safety protocols that led to several surges of power inside of the reactor. This led to a chain reaction of explosions within reactor number four that culminated in a massive explosion that blew the lid off the building, exposing the reactor's core. It would take the Soviets 10 days to finally stop the fire that was raging inside of this exposed core, which meant for those 10 days, radiation on an unprecedented level was spewed into the environment by this fire. But even after the fire was controlled, you have all this radioactive material that needs to be properly disposed of. And so so the Soviets started by using robots to go up and pick up these materials and dispose of them, but the robots were breaking down from the high levels of radiation. And so naturally, the Soviets sent in groups of men to go pick up the material, and dozens of people died from radiation sickness. A few months after the explosion, the first steel sarcophagus was built around reactor number four to try to contain some of that radiation. But even with that protection, it's estimated that the area around Chernobyl will not be habitable for another 20,000 years. So as a result, the Soviet Union created what they call an exclusion zone, which is 19 miles all around Chernobyl that no one can go inside of. And so nature's kind of reclaimed this area that used to be a fairly bustling metropolis. One year after the disaster, Ukrainian containment crews finally broke into the steam corridor that was located underneath the molten remains of reactor number four. And as soon as they stepped in, their radiation readers spiked all the way to the top. And so they know that whatever's at the the other end of this L-shaped hallway is something they did not want to get close to. And so they put a camera on a chair with wheels and they pushed it down the hall to where it finally broke that corner and had a clear line of sight to the other end. And using a timer on the camera, they were able to take a picture of one of the single most dangerous things in the entire world. It became known as the elephant's foot. It was a molten pile of nuclear fuel and melted metal and sand and concrete that had all kind of converged and seeped through a pipe meant for steam and found its way into the basement. It was and still is emitting the equivalent level of radiation of four and a half million chest x-rays every hour. Today, if you were to stand in front of the elephant's foot without proper equipment for 30 seconds, your cells would start to hemorrhage and you would become viciously ill and you could even die. At two minutes of exposure, you're definitely going to die but not right away. You have 48 hours and there's nothing you can do to stop it. You are 100% going to die. On October 31st, 2013, four mechanics were performing routine maintenance on a wind turbine in the Netherlands. In the early afternoon, all four of them are standing on top of the turbine itself, two on one end and two on the other, and a small fire breaks out inside of the housing of the turbine, right near where you would go back into the housing. Now, it's unclear what caused the fire, but it's speculated that it was caused by a short circuit. The two engineers on this side of the turbine were able to jump over the fire, land in the stairwell, and run their way down to safety. The other two on this side had a bad angle and could not make the jump, and so they had to wait until rescue workers showed up to put the fire out. But wind turbines are usually in areas that are very far away from society because they're huge and they're kind of eyesores. 
And so the response time was not good. The fire department did not show up very quickly. And by the time they got to the wind turbine, that little fire had gotten much, much bigger and had creeped up onto the platform that they are on. And then when the fire department actually started performing their job, the fire had spread well down the stairwell. And so it was very difficult and took a very long time to make their way up using the stairs. And the crane on the truck itself did not extend high enough to reach them either. The two trapped mechanics are watching this in real time. They're looking down and they can see the fire department is not going to be able to reach us in time because the fire is now spreading and getting bigger and bigger and they're being pushed to the very edge of this wind turbine with an 80 meter fall to the ground. As the fire inched closer and closer and closer to them, the men must have realized that they have to make a decision here. They can either sit here and wait and hope for some miracle that perhaps a helicopter shows up and scoops them up or some other mechanism of rescue is able to occur or they try to make a run for it through the flames on the top of the turbine into the stairwell and just hope that the fire in the stairwell is not as severe and that maybe they can run through it and make it out the other side. Or the final option is to jump off the side and hope you survive the fall. And so as the fire continued to grow and get closer and closer to them, the men embrace one last time, and then one of them makes a run for it through the flames into the stairwell. His charred body would be found right at the landing of the stairs. He did not make it very far. He really had no hope. The last remaining mechanic is standing there wondering what he should do. He's probably looking down in hopes that he's going to see his friend who just ran in there emerge at the bottom on the ground safe but he doesn't. And after a considerable amount of time and the fire is getting closer and closer, he knows his friend didn't make it and probably not wanting to suffer the fate that his friend did, he jumps. This is the picture of the two mechanics embracing for that final time. I'm sure at the time of this picture, they were aware that almost certainly they were not going to get out of this alive. They were 19 and 21 years old. In 2013, Philip Chisholm was a 14-year-old high school student going to school in Danvers, Massachusetts. He lived at home with his single mother. Classmates described Chisholm as being quiet, a bit of a loner. He was a great student, and he was the leading scorer of his soccer team. On October 22nd, 2013, Chisholm missed soccer practice in the afternoon and then missed a team dinner that night, at which point his teammates tried calling and texting him. He didn't get back to them, so they got in touch with his mother. She tried reaching out to him to no avail, and so she contacted the police and said, my son is missing. On the same night that Chisholm is reported missing, one of his teachers, 24-year-old old Colleen Ritzer doesn't come home from work. Her family and her friends try reaching out to her, texting her, calling her, no response. So they too go to the police and they report her missing as well. The police were already looking for Chisholm. So when they hear one of his teachers is also missing, they assume they must be linked. And so they go to the high school, even though it's well after hours, to see if maybe there's some clues there. They search the high school and Chisholm is not there and neither is Miss Ritzer. But when they're looking in the girls' restroom that was right next to Miss Ritzer's classroom, they find a small splash of blood. Even though at the time they had no way of knowing if this blood was connected to Chisholm or Miss Ritzer, they decided they would pull all the security footage for the past 24 hours that was looking in the direction of this bathroom. And they make a startling discovery starting at the 2.54 p.m. mark on October 22nd, the day they went missing. This is Miss Ritzer walking down the hall towards the bathroom that had blood in it. This is Chisholm following Miss Ritzer into the hall. He's looking hesitant. He doesn't really know what he's gonna do. He's thinking about following her. And at some point he says, you know what? I am gonna do this. He goes back into the classroom re-emerges with his hood on and walks down the hall towards the bathroom where Miss Ritzer is. This is Chisholm entering the girl's bathroom with surgical gloves on. 11 minutes later, Chisholm would leave the bathroom. Miss Ritzer would still be inside. Chisholm would leave school property. He would run outside. He would get a big recycling bin and then he would wheel that back into the school and then he would go back into the bathroom with the recycling bin. At 3.21 p.m., 26 minutes after Chisholm had first entered the girls' bathroom after Miss Ritzer, he re-emerges, now wearing a full face mask, he doesn't have a sweatshirt on anymore, and he's pulling along this recycling bin that looks noticeably heavier than when he brought it in. And that's because Miss Ritzer's body is now stuffed inside of it. 
Police were able to locate Ms. Ritzer's body using the surveillance cameras on the outside of the school. They just watched what he did with the recycling bin and he didn't bring it very far away from the school. Police were able to quickly track Chisholm down and arrest him because as soon as he was done attacking Ms. Ritzer, he used her credit card to go to a movie theater in town and watched a movie. So he's on security cameras watching the movie and the police were tracking her credit cards because they noticed they were stolen and they saw that he had swiped the card at this movie theater. So he gets arrested and he's given a life sentence. Here is the footage of Chisholm leaving the girl's bathroom with Miss Ritzer's body inside of that recycling bin. His motives remain unclear, but he claims she used what he called a trigger word that really upset him. At 7.27 p.m. on February 9th, 2004, a woman called the Grafton County Sheriff's Department to report a car accident. A small black sedan appeared to be wedged up against a snowbank off the side of the highway near this woman's house in Woodsville, New Hampshire. The sheriff thanked her for calling and dispatched officers to check it out. 16 minutes later at 7.43 p.m., the sheriff's department gets another call about this black sedan up against the snowbank, and it came in from a local school bus driver. The driver said he was going down the road and he sees this black sedan up against the side of the road and what appeared to be the driver, this young woman, no one was helping her. So the school bus driver pulls over and walks up to her. She says her name is Maura Murray. She's 21 years old. She's a college student in Massachusetts. She seemed totally fine, but was adamant that he did not call call the police. And so the school bus driver at the time didn't call the police. He kind of sized her up as seeming like she was okay. She said she was going to call for a tow truck. And so he left thinking she was going to be just fine. But only a couple of minutes after leaving the scene, he felt like, you know what, I got to call the police because something just seemed off. The sheriff tells him that they had already gotten a call about 20 minutes earlier and that officers would be there any minute. And I'm sure she's just fine. Three minutes later, the officer who was originally dispatched to check out this black sedan shows up and radios in and says the black sedan is here, but there's no girl. There's no driver. Police do an initial search of the area. They can't find Mora. There's no sign of where she would have gone. There's no sign of a struggle. They get in touch with Mora's family. They can't get in touch with Mora. And so it's like she just kind of vanished. And so that night, they labeled Mora officially a missing person. On February 8th, the day before Mora went missing, she was with her father. They went out to eat, and he would say to police that she seemed totally normal. There was no red flags. There was no clear stressors in her life. Everything just seemed normal. The next morning when she gets up on February 9th, this is the day she goes missing, she finds out that all of her classes that day have been canceled because of a snowstorm. She gets up, goes over to her computer, and emails all of her professors, as well as her work supervisor, and tells them that there's been a death in her family and she needs to take the next week off. Family members would say that there was no death in the family, that that was a lie. After emailing her professors, she drives to an ATM, withdraws $280, and then goes to a liquor store and buys $40 worth of alcohol. She also stopped at the Amherst DMV to get some paperwork she needed for some damage that had been done to her car. After that, we don't really know what she was doing until she wound up on that snowbank in Woodsville, New Hampshire. When police searched her abandoned car, they found printed out directions to a condo complex in Burlington, Vermont. Cell phone records show Mora had placed a call to one of the owners of a condo that had been put up for rent, but Mora had not indicated to anyone in her life that she was looking to rent a condo in Burlington, Vermont. Nor had she indicated to anyone that she might be traveling to Vermont for any reason. When they searched her dorm room, all of her belongings had been packed and her room had been meticulously cleaned. It was clear that she was getting ready to leave her dorm, but this this is mid-semester. There's no reason she'd be leaving prematurely. And on top of her belongings in her dorm room was this typed up note to her boyfriend detailing all of their relationship issues. It wasn't a breakup note, but it was definitely something close to that. Most of Mora's belongings were either in her dorm room, all packed up, or in her abandoned car but her cell phone, debit cards, and credit cards were all missing. However, they were never used again after the day she went missing, February 9th. Six days after Mora went missing, a massive search is conducted around her abandoned car. They covered 20 square miles. They had helicopters. They had sent sniffing dogs. They had hundreds of people on the ground, and there was just no trace of her. But even more strangely, on the night Mora went missing, there was snow on the ground. So you'd think you'd be able to find a couple footprints showing you where Mora might have gone, but there was none. And the scent 
sniffing dogs could only track her scent about 100 feet away from the car before they lost the scent. It was like she vanished into thin air. So something happened to Maura Murray between 7.46 p.m. when the bus driver left the scene and called the police. He said she was there, he saw her, and 7.49 p.m. when the officer who was dispatched arrived on scene and Maura's not there. She went somewhere, we just don't know where or why or with who. And unfortunately, to this day, this case remains unsolved. Here is the final picture of Maura Murray. This is her withdrawing $280 at that ATM shortly before she hopped back in her car, drove up to Woodsville, New Hampshire, crashed on the side of the road, and then disappeared. Armin Mibus seemed like a really good guy. He mowed his neighbor's lawn, he offered to fix his friend's cars, he would host these great dinner parties at his house. But underneath that charming outer layer, Armin Mibus was a deeply disturbed individual. In 2001, Armin would place an ad on the internet seeking a young, well-built man that is looking to be slaughtered and then consumed. Mibus actually got a lot of replies to this and people acted like they were interested, but I think people were just responding because it was such an outrageous thing he was asking for. So no one went through with it. Until a man named Bernard Brandis saw it, who had previously placed an ad on the internet himself asking if there was anybody out there that would slaughter and eat him. So perfect match. So Brandis reaches out to Armin and says, yes, I'd love to. And on March 9th, 2001, the two meet up at Armin's house. Brandis lays down in the bathtub while Armin sets up a video camera. He wants to film this for a variety of reasons, but mostly he wants to make sure that everybody sees that Brandis is doing this willingly. On camera, Brandis gives Armin the go-ahead. Initially, Armin tries biting into Brandis, but apparently he was too chewy, so Brandis suggests he gets a knife. After successfully removing a piece of Brandis, Armin fries it up in a pan, and the two of them begin to eat it. But apparently it was too burned to either of their liking, and they would feed that piece of him to the dog. At this point, Brandis is in and out of consciousness because he's losing a lot of blood, so Armin decides to take a break and go to his room and read a Star Trek book. When Armin goes back in the bathroom, it's clear that Brandis is still alive, but he's on the verge of death. So after much deliberation and quite a bit of praying, Armin ultimately ends Brandis' life and then proceeds to butcher him and put all of his meat into a freezer. Over the next 10 months, Armin would consume over 44 pounds of Brandis. In December of 2001, Armin put another ad online seeking somebody else that wanted to be eaten, and that ad would get sent to the police who would go to Armin's house. They would find Brandis' remains behind pizza boxes in the back of his freezer, and they would arrest Armin. Despite showing police the videotape that showed Brandis repeatedly consenting to what was happening to him, Armin was still given a life sentence. This is the picture that Brandis put online in hopes that it would attract someone that would want to eat him. And this is the bathtub where Armin Mivis would grant Brandis that wish. A disaster began to quietly unfold at 8.49 a.m. on April 16th, 2014. The Seawall Ferry that was on a routine trip to Jeju Island in South Korea was beginning to lean very badly to one side. The ferry had recently undergone illegal renovations, adding a whole bunch of new rooms to the top of the ferry that made it much more profitable, but dangerously top-heavy. Corrupt regulators who were bought off with fancy dinners and travel allowed the ship to sail unsafe despite never having stepped foot on board. Had they gone on the ship themselves, they would have seen immediately how unsafe it was. On April 16th, the day this ferry is making its way to Jeju Island and is now leaning to one side, ferry workers had loaded twice the legal limit onto the ferry and then hadn't properly secured really any of it. So there were cars and shipping containers that were not tethered. So as the badly balanced seawall ferry is making its way out to Jeju Island, it hits some very strong currents and makes a sharp turn to avoid them causing the ship to begin to keel over. As soon as it begins to keel over, all those unsecured cars and containers all shift all at once to one side of the ship, causing it to completely roll over on its side and begin sinking. On board were 476 passengers, of which 325 were high school students on a school trip. 
As soon as the ship comes to rest on its side, the captain comes over the intercom and tells everybody to stay in your rooms and await further instruction. And everybody listens. They all stay in their room. And honestly, you can't blame them because they're on a routine ferry trip that happens dozens of times a day without any incident. And the captain of the ship is telling you everything's fine. You just stay where you are. We'll tell you what to do next. After a little while, a lot of the students start to feel a little bit anxious because there's been no further instruction. They're still sideways and they're starting to realize that if they needed to, it would be hard to get out of the ship. A lot of them were way into the bowels of the ship and they would literally need to climb up and out of the ship to safety. A student actually called the authorities and said, hey, I think the ship I'm on is sinking and the authorities hadn't heard of it because the captain and the crew of the ship were just totally crippled and could not make a decision and had wasted all this time that they could have been evacuating people and getting help and instead were just panicked and frozen in terror. There would be over 20 calls from students pleading with authorities to come save them because now they know the ship is sinking because they can hear the sound of water rushing into the ship and it's just a matter of time before it reaches them. Finally, almost an hour after the ship had originally keeled over onto its side, the captain issues the evacuation call to the whole ship. But at this point, water's already getting into the compartments where these students have been told to stay and students aren't able to leave and there's this panic to get out of the ship. So the evacuation evacuation order was doing nothing. It was already too late. One person who survived who had left early and disobeyed the stay in your room order, they had climbed to the top of the ship, which was really the side of the ship, and they were looking down into the ship through a hallway, and they said there was this mass of people that were coming out of their rooms and trying to climb up this hallway right as a rush of water poured in through the side of this hallway and completely filled it, and they were gone. Later on, when divers would go down to recover the bodies, they would find that many of the students had broken fingers from desperately trying to climb up those hallways when water was pouring in on them. After the divers recovered the bodies, investigators began going through their cell phones to get some sense of what happened. And on their phones were these tragic pictures and videos of these students staying in their rooms like they were told to do, just waiting for their captain to give them further instruction that never came. The captain actually abandoned ship right after that 9.30 call to evacuate came when hundreds of students were still down below. He left the ship. So they were totally on their own, just waiting for help that never came. Of the 476 passengers, 304 would perish, and many believe that almost all of them could have been saved had they just evacuated as soon as the ship keeled over. And so as a result of his gross negligence, the captain was given a life sentence. So In 2014, the United States Navy decided it was time to decommission one of their old frigate ships, and so they sent it to a dock to be broken down for scrap. In order for workers to actually be able to access the underside of the ship and actually begin to break it down, they would need to dry dock the ship, which meant the ship would basically drive into this special locking corral where the doors would shut behind it, the water would drain out from underneath, and the ship would be left resting on these huge wooden blocks that elevated it off the ground. And with no water in there, workers were able to get underneath the hull and could access every part of the ship without obstruction. It's important to note for this story that when a ship is in dry dock, there is only one way on or off. It's this ramp called a gangway that leads from the dock onto the deck of the ship. Besides that, there is nowhere else for you to get on this ship. And if for some reason you really wanted to get on and couldn't use the gangway, you could in theory try to run and leap from the dock to the ship. There's a pretty significant gap there all the way around, but you could try the jump. But if you weren't successful at grabbing onto the ship, you would fall multiple stories, probably to your death, because there's no water in the dry dock. So this old frigate ship that was being decommissioned was officially dry docked in July of 2014. The first group of people that went on board the ship to begin dismantling it were military personnel. They were in charge of removing all of the sensitive equipment before civilians were allowed to go on board. The military personnel begin to wrap up and it's getting late in the day and they tell the foreman who's in charge of all of the civilian workers that are going to be going on and finishing this decommissioning of this ship. They go to the foreman and they say, hey, we're done. We're wrapped up for the night. Your workers are good to go. They can get on here tomorrow. The foreman would send a message to his boss that night, letting him know that they were on track to start work the next day. 
the boss would respond and say, hey, can you go on there tonight and take pictures of all the different workstations so we know how many people that we need to place in different segments of this big ship. So the foreman walks onto the ship and proceeds to take hundreds of pictures all over the inside of the ship. Now, the ship itself was pitch black inside. There was no electricity and it was nighttime. So he had a flashlight the whole time, but whenever he took a picture, he would turn his flashlight off and then use the flash on his camera before going back to his actual flashlight. So all night he's going room to room taking all these pictures and at some point he realizes he's photographed everything he needs to. So he leaves, he goes back to his office, he uploads the pictures and he sends them to his boss. His boss wrote back almost immediately and just said, who's the guy with the axe. Now, the foreman has no idea what he's talking about. He was just in the ship by himself for a couple of hours and didn't see anyone. So he reads the email again to make sure he read it correctly, and he sees that his boss has actually attached the picture he is referring to. Here is this guy clearly clutching an ax in a hallway that he was just in. And even creepier is the foreman is looking at where this picture was taken, and it was relatively early on in his photo shoot. And he had walked past the exact area where this guy is poking his head out of, which which means the whole time he was down there, this guy with an ax was there with him. They review the security footage of a camera that was aimed directly at the ramp, the one entrance in and out of this ship. And from the time the foreman left, no one else left. So they don't know how he got on or how he got off without being detected, but somehow he did. In 2014, Alan Ruby was a 19-year-old freshman studying political science at the University of Oklahoma. Despite being relatively modest and soft-spoken in person on social media, he projected this lifestyle of wealth and grandeur. He'd oftentimes post pictures of exotic sports cars and expensive watches and clothes, and he would travel the world to Paris, London, New York City, and take all these pictures showing off this incredible life he had. He really wanted people to believe that he was this fabulously wealthy successful guy. Alan was only able to project this phony lifestyle on social media because he was spending his father's money. His father was a successful businessman who was also the publisher of a newspaper that was quite successful and so Alan would just spend his money and then even after his father would give him money Alan would steal his credit card and additionally rack up thousands of dollars of credit card debt. But as media began to shift away from print media to almost all digital, a lot of newspapers began to fail because they weren't able to transition to digital. And his father's newspaper was not making that transition very well and they were losing money left and right. And so Alan's father told everybody in his family with a focus on Alan, that we all need to cut back on our spending because money's tight right now and it's unclear if it's gonna turn around. So we gotta be careful with how much money we do have. Alan acted like he was gonna cut back on his lavish lifestyle, but in reality, he wasn't going to. He was totally addicted to spending money and giving off this vibe that he was so wealthy and successful. And so around this time, Alan steals his grandmother's credit card and secretly leaves the country and goes to Paris to have this vacation on his own. He's taking these pictures in front of the Eiffel Tower and he's spending all this money. And his father finds out that he's stolen this credit card and he's furious. And instead of waiting for Alan to come home and saying, don't do that, again, he decides he's going to send him a message that he's going to remember, and he calls the police. Alan gets charged with theft, he pleads guilty, and he has to go before a judge who sees that he has no criminal record, so he kind of goes easy on him, and he says that you need to pay back all the money you spent to your grandmother, and you need to go to an addiction program to try to break this habit of yours, to stop spending all this money. After Alan leaves court, his father felt like he finally got the message. It seemed like it had finally gotten through to him that this was a really big problem, and he felt like he had made the right decision in calling the police. But in reality, Alan hadn't changed at all. As soon as he got back from court, he was stealing from people outside of the family, he was taking loans from loan sharks, all of this just to keep up with this phony appearance he portrayed on social media. On October 9th, 2014, Alan owed $3,000 to a particular loan shark and had no way of paying it back. So instead of asking his parents for money, which for him would have been too embarrassing, he decides the best course of action is to kill his entire family. And so he strolls into his home and he shoots his mom dead, he shoots his sister dead, and then he waits for his dad to come home and he shoots him dead. Because his big plan is with his whole family gone, he's gonna become the sole heir to the family's estate and that will be enough money to not only pay off this $3,000 debt, but have a little leftover so he can go on vacation to Paris again. So after he's committed 
this horrible crime. He leaves his family where they are. He goes and takes the surveillance footage from inside the house. It was on a DVD, takes the DVD out, takes the murder weapon, leaves the house, chucks the DVD and the weapon into a lake and proceeds to drive to Dallas where he checks into a very fancy hotel and meets up with friends and parties the whole weekend. His friends that were with him that weekend would later tell investigators that Alan seemed totally normal. There was no red flags. There was no indication that anything was wrong. He was just laughing it up and having a great time that whole weekend. The following Monday, when Alan's father doesn't show up for work, the police are notified. They go to the house and they find the Ruby family. When police went out and got Alan and brought him back to the station to chat with him and tell him what happened and see if he knew anything, his sad reaction to his whole family now being deceased was apparently so insincere that officers almost immediately assumed that he was probably the guy that did it. Ultimately, Allen would confess and the prosecutor wanted to push for the death penalty, but Allen's remaining living family members actually said, don't do the death penalty. We don't wanna risk that not happening. We wanna see justice served right now. Can we create a plea agreement where he gets life in jail, but there's absolutely no way for him to get paroled, no matter how good his behavior is, no matter how old he is, no matter what, he can't ever get out of jail. And so they did. They created that plea agreement. They gave it to Alan to sign. He signs it. And as they're walking out of the courtroom, his last remaining family members disown him and say, may God have mercy on your soul. And they leave. This is the picture that Alan uploaded to his Instagram account just hours after killing his entire family. They're all lying on the ground in his house at the time this picture is being taken. He's in this fancy hotel room with his friends and the caption reads, college wouldn't be half as fun without these two peaches. Hashtag best friends. One night in the early 1950s, a little boy named Issei Sagawa was having this dream where he and his brother were being boiled alive to be eaten. Sagawa says when he woke up, he immediately began fantasizing about what it would be like to be on the other side of that, to be on the outside with a human inside of the pot that you're boiling, that you're going to eat. And he became totally obsessed with the idea of eating another person. By the time he was in first grade, he would find himself staring at his different classmates' legs and his mouth would be watering because he wanted to take a bite out of their leg. For three decades, he was able to suppress that urge, but in 1981, those cannibalistic urges would get the better of him. One summer day while he was in Tokyo, he saw this woman that he wanted to eat and he couldn't help himself. And so he began following her down the road and he saw her go into her apartment. He waited for a minute, went around back and climbed in the window. And when he got inside, she was asleep. And he hadn't thought of a plan for what he was gonna do once he was inside. And so he's just standing there thinking, well, now what do I do? How am I gonna eat her? What am I gonna do next? And as he's sitting there wondering what to do next, she wakes up and she screams and he runs away. After this breaking and entering incident, Sagawa would actually seek help. So he goes to a psychiatrist and he says, this is what I did. I snuck into her house because I wanted to eat her. And the psychiatrist would end up telling Sagawa's family that I have to label him a high risk to society because he's not just thinking about doing these things. He's already acting out these fantasies. Now, Sagawa's father was extremely wealthy and powerful. And when he heard this from the psychiatrist, he was like, no, we're not gonna do that. And so using his power and influence, he was able to kind of cover up what the psychiatrist had found and he shipped his son to Paris. Once Sagawa landed in Paris, he enrolled at the Sorbonne University and began studying literature. Despite having sought help for his cannibalistic urges, when he was in Paris, he started having that urge again and he couldn't control it. And instead of going to another therapist or psychiatrist, he begins to look for another victim. Sagawa considered himself short, weak, and ugly. And so he was actually looking for a tall, beautiful Western woman so he could absorb their energy and somehow become a bigger, better version of himself. And so he began looking around Paris for tall, beautiful women that he could potentially eat, but no one seemed like a good fit until he met Renee Hartvelt. Renee was a tall, beautiful 25-year-old Dutch student who was going to school with Sagawa at Sorbonne. In order to get close to her, Sagawa would ask his father if he would give him some money so he could hire Renee to be his personal tutor. His father gives him the money, Sagawa hires Renee, and they strike up this working relationship together. And over time, Sagawa would build trust with 
with Renee. They would become friends. And at some point he asked Renee if she'll actually come over to his apartment, something they had not done yet. And she's sitting in his apartment with her back turned to him. He leaves the room and comes back with a rifle and he tries to fire it, but it jams. And she hasn't heard him do this. And so he's standing there and his weapon's now jammed. He hasn't fired it. And he just puts the weapon away and comes back out and acts like nothing's happened. And he's sitting there wondering, is this a sign that I'm not supposed to do this? But at the end of the night, when she finally left, he decides, you know what, I gotta go through with this. I have to eat her. And so the next night he gets her to come over again. He gets the rifle out when she's sitting with her back to him once again, except this time the rifle fires. Only for an instant, he felt really bad and thought maybe I should call an ambulance. But then he stopped himself and he said, you've waited so long for this. You gotta just go through with it. He immediately tried to take a bite out of her, but it was too difficult and unpalatable. So he calmly leaves his apartment. He goes to the store, he gets a blade. He comes back and he's able to begin removing pieces of Renee so he can eat them. Over the next two days, Sagawa would eat most of Renee and he would take pictures of himself throughout the entire experience. When he finally felt full, he left a couple pieces still in his freezer, but put the rest of her in a suitcase and went to dump her in a lake. But as he was wheeling these heavy suitcases around town, people saw them and it just drew a lot of suspicion. And at some point, someone must have called the police. They show up, they ask him what's inside the suitcase, they open it up and there's Renee. When questioned about it, he just said, I killed her to eat her flesh. Sagawa awaited trial for two years in a French prison. And when he finally went in front of a French judge, when the judge read the details of this crime, it seemed so crazy and outrageous that the judge decided there's no way Sagawa can be sane. And so he was deemed insane and unfit to stand trial. He was ordered to go to a mental institution where he would be held indefinitely. Shortly after that, the French deported Sagawa back to Japan where they expected him to remain in a mental institution for the rest of his life. But that didn't happen because the French dropped his case and his documents were sealed. And when he arrived in Japan, the Japanese could not get access to his court documents. And so they did not have a case against Sagawa. And so they had to let him walk free. And so in 1986, Sagawa checked himself out of the Japanese mental institution that he had been sent to, and he's been free ever since. This is a picture of what police discovered when they opened up Sagawa's fridge inside of his apartment in Paris. This is a picture of his kitchen inside of that apartment, where you can clearly see plates and different utensils that were all used to eat Renee. This is a picture of the suitcase that Sagawa was lugging around that police showed up and asked him to open and found Renee inside of. And this is Sagawa today, walking freely in Tokyo, even though he blatantly killed and ate someone and openly admits to it and has even profited off of it. He's written books and he's been featured on TV shows. He's even been called in to be a food critic. But what's even more horrifying is that Sagawa openly says that before he dies, he's going to do this again. He can't live with himself unless he eats at least one more person.